All right. So, children of gay parents that are married cannot be baptized in the LDS Church, part two. All right. So I've got a few notes um, about this part two video. Uh, first of all, if you didn't see part one, my initial reaction was, wow, this is not cool. This uh, flies in the face of some of our core teachings as Mormons and doesn't feel right. Um, nothing to do with gays or polygamists or whatever it is, but just denying the gospel to anyone just doesn't feel right. However, I've got some interesting insights and different information that I wanted to talk about and bring up and some revelation that I feel I have received on the topic. So to start off, um, again, this that's kind of why I'm here, just explaining um, about the policy. The church issued a policy in the handbook that says, essentially, um, if there are gay couples, gay and lesbian couples that are married, their children are not allowed to be baptized until they are 18. Those are couples that have full custody of those children. Um, there's been some different speculation on why this may be. John DeLynn gave a kind of uh, somewhat critical analysis um, his, his thought was kind of to stop the hemorrhaging of church members thinking that being gay is okay. So if they can kind of cut out all of the gay, so to speak, then church members won't find out that, oh, gay people are normal. You know, gay people are nice. And I don't go along with that. I, I There's like a slight point in there that I think is, is, is right which is I think that the church definitely does want to make a clear stance on, on the issue. Obviously, they always do and always and repeatedly do, beating a dead horse kind of thing. But I don't think that their idea is, oh, let's uh, stop these members from thinking that gay is okay. Like, I don't know. Um, NPR did a, a little skit. I didn't listen to it, but you might check that out. NPR interviewed one of the uh, the church leaders, not a leader, but a church historian, rather. And I listened to a little bit of it and wasn't really going anywhere, so it didn't do it for me. I turned it off. Uh, there was like a theory of kind of like, is this a purging? Is this, uh, you know, there's these, these members that are on the cusps. There's these members that are kind of on the fringe already. So let's do this policy and, and purge purge them from our midst, you know, kind of a, an infected wound philosophy where if you have an infection in your arm, it's better to chop it off um, above the infection rather than let the infection spread to the whole body. So some people have kind of theorized, oh, maybe this is a, a purging where the church is kind of cutting off the wound so that this infection doesn't keep spreading. And I don't really go along with that either. Um, the church did give some clarification. Um, someone got mad at me for scoffing at the last clarification, and I'm not scoffing at it. I'm just saying that it wasn't really that clear. I mean, the only clarification that I saw was the custody had to be full custody of the children. So if children were in partial custody with a straight couple or their mom had full custody of them and their dad didn't have full custody, but... Um, was in a gay married married relationship, then those kids could still be baptized. So that was a clarification that I guess was necessary, um, but that was slight but important. Um, there was so a couple other points I've I've read. There's um, a couple other blogs and a couple other um, mostly people that have left the church and commented or critiqued and. Um, but some of the things that I, that stood out to me in those blogs and that stood out to me on my own Facebook timeline, um, were when the policy first came out, 
there were a lot of people that said, oh, this can't be real, or oh, this isn't real, or oh, it's made up, or oh, John Lynn just faked it. And for me, I felt the same way, which was pretty telling, uh, right? I mean, it's like if it, if it immediately screams to you of, oh, this must be fake, the church would never do this, you know, there's some explaining to do. Um, I've some of the other things that have happened since since this. Um, I've had a couple friends and Facebook friends or coworkers or previous you know previous coworkers or friends that were dismayed of of my opinion on this of, of my opinion of like being shocked. You know they were their response was I can't believe that this is happening to you. I can't believe that you're going through this and. I hope that you make it through, uh, or you know what? You really need to take it to the temple. You really need to pray to God. You know, you know, just like you know, what, guys, like I, I prayed about it. I have gone to the temple and I have received answers. But thanks, and and it was just kind of weird. I mean, it was very condescending and weird. Um, but. Some of those friends also later, when they saw that I was praying and saw that I was going to the temple, they did offer apologies, and so kudos to that. Um, I also wanted to talk about how other friends that have, you know, they've said thank you. Thank you for voicing your opinion. Thank you for standing up for what you feel. Um, and even people that just say thank you for standing up against critics of the church. And I've had a lot of outpouring of support, I feel, from people that I didn't have any idea that were listening or people that I didn't have any idea that were viewing and um, a random friend at a Christmas party that I haven't seen in six years came up to me and said, hey, I really like your videos and um, and what you're doing there and stuff. And another friend that I haven't seen in 10 years messaged me out of the blue and said, hey, thank you so much for, for doing what you do. And like, I've had another friend that invited me to go to the temple with him because one of his um, in-laws was struggling with the gospel and um, this particular over this issue was thinking of resigning and that he felt that if we went to the temple that we could you know, pray for her and, and try to help her to come back to the church. And so it's like, um, I see where some people just can't have any idea or can't comprehend that I would have um, a problem with this 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 policy and still remain active. They think that you can't have any kind of uh, going against the grain and still support the brethren and still believe the gospel is true and still believe in God. Um, but I, I don't see my faith in that way. I still I see my faith as is very personal. Um, I see my faith that God is, is very real. And I trust God. I, that's one thing about being Mormon is that we trust God and we listen to God. And at least that's what we're taught to do. And above all, God should be first. And so that's where I, I put my faith is in God and Jesus Christ. And if I feel I'm being pulled away from that, then there's an issue. But luckily, I, I, I still feel very connected. Um, I also wanted to talk about how my bishop was super supportive. I mean, he, he posted a thing on Facebook and said some very enlightening things. He didn't really, you know, stand on one side or the other. He said, you know, I empathize and I, I love each of you and wherever people are on this issue, I'm here for you. And it was very comforting and very respectful. Today, he said something in, in the class that was more about, you know what, you guys, you need to you do need to be careful about what you post on social media, not not to censor yourself, but just know that your voices um, do influence other people for good and for bad, and just to recognize that. And I do recognize that, and I, I thank him for that counsel, and other times of reaching out since then, of just saying, hey, my door's always open, you're always welcome to come talk. And I don't feel any kind of, you know, I don't feel any kind of uh, strain between my relationship with Yod as such. But I do appreciate that, and I do appreciate that even though um, that initial post that many of you didn't see could be seen as controversial, 
he was still there for for love and and it was good um, one particular blog post that I, I read um, was she was talking about how uh, the cognitive dissonance for for members that originally thought it was fake and that's the one thing that really does bother me is like just because there are members that do have cognitive dissonance with many different aspects of the church doesn't mean we all do first off and second of all I see the cognitive dissonance work with members that have fallen away just the same I mean you have to write off all of those spiritual experiences you have to write off the Holy Ghost teaching you so many different things you have to write off spiritual experiences around blessings around um, funerals around church services around testimony meeting I mean there's a lot of cognitive dissonance there that you have to to put to the side so a lot of the things that I see um, people that left the church criticizing members for they're battling the same things of, of trying to I mean as hard as it is for some members to you know say oh the church is true and try to lift it up with all these different things um, people that have left kind of have to do the same thing and kind of do the whack-a-mole thing where it's like oh the church isn't true oh wait I remember when I was eight and I had that oh wait no I got to push that down and oh I remember when I was 18 and then I, and I got the milk I said no oh wait and and so it's kind of the same thing I mean yeah there's a whole bunch of stuff that I think that we could do without in the church that doesn't really build our faith and doesn't really help us but I think it is important to hold on to those things that are true and hold on to those things that are real and you can throw out the rest in my mind but don't let it be this thing where like oh because there's some some garbage over here I'm gonna have to throw away all these spiritual experiences that I had and throw away God and throw away Jesus don't do that keep God keep Jesus keep the restoration of the gospel keep the priesthood keep the things that are good um, and if you find some garbage it's okay you can throw that away and still remain active and a good member of your your church and your society um, I wanted to talk about the revelation process and the way that it comes and I'm, I'm wrapping up here quickly last video was 20 minutes we're gonna try to keep this one under 15 um, so revelation is is very real for me and I, I do believe that you can receive answers from God and if you go to any Mormon church that's a pretty common theme when people talk about feeling the spirit talk about feeling impressions feeling promptings um, feeling God tell them to do things one way or another um, I've heard people tell me oh that's you're psycho you're crazy whatever it is I'm like all right well that's cool you can call me whatever you want to call me but this God thing is real and he really can and will direct you if you want there is some very important criteria that I have stressed in previous videos and will continue to stress that is you have to believe that God is there you have to believe that you can receive an answer because if you don't believe that he's there and he gives you an answer you're gonna write it off as something else and, and that's generally how it works is if people leave the church then they have to write off those answers as something else as coincidence or as they made it up in their mind or they just told themselves what they wanted to hear you know um, my experience is that God usually tells you things that you don't want to do um, you have to really be willing to listen you have to be willing to act on the answer that you receive so if, if God's going if you're gonna God's gonna speak to you you really need to listen you need to want to listen and just to do it no matter what even if it's something that's difficult or something you don't really want to do if, if God tells you to go join the Navy you need to go join the Navy if God tells you, you need to go to get your MBA at Stanford go get your MBA at Stanford if God tells you you need to go across the street and see if your neighbor's okay right now 10 o'clock at night you need to go across the street and see if your neighbor's okay 10 o'clock at night it's worth a shot the only way you can tell if it's God is by tuning it by fine-tuning it by listening and trying it um, it's gonna take some trial and error you might listen sometimes and think oh is that God I'm not sure go try it listen and see you'll you'll be able to feel the Holy Ghost telling you um, after you've done it either well done my son or daughter or 
if there's just a stupor, then it probably wasn't from God. And so as you kind of try it out and try different things, you'll be able to really hone in and, and really figure out, okay, this is when God is speaking to me. Oh, this is what it feels like when God is speaking to me. Oh, this is the last 10 times I did this, it was exactly right when I had this feeling. Um, I should try that again. So it is like a scientific process of, of trial and error and faith and repentance even, but it's all about listening to God. And so my first couple answers on this topic, my first one was wait. My second one was wait, you don't have enough information. My third one was like, hey, just leave it alone for now. Quit stressing about it because I was getting kind of bent, bent out of shape about it. And God was like, just leave it alone for now. And the fourth answer I received, I'm going to read to you now. And I'll tell you a little bit about the experience. Um, and sometimes answers from God don't always come right when you're praying. Sometimes they come later when you've waited. And I was basically just walking in my living room and I had this distinct impression read the book of Venus and I kind of left it for a second and again it came read the book of Venus and so I read the book of Venus and I'm gonna to read to you now the verses specifically that stuck out to me um, and then the prompting went away the feeling to read the book of Venus went away so the book of Venus is, is simply one chapter um, that is the only chapter is the full book. And here is what it said. So this is chapter, so I'm going to read you the chapter heading. So it says, Enos, this is uh, my film, Enos prays mightily and gains a remission of his sin. Sins, the voice of the Lord comes into his mind, promising salvation for the Lamanites at a future day. The Nephites sought to reclaim the Lamanites. Enos rejoices in his redeemer. Um, so basically, Enos is like, he's famous for praying all day long. Um, but basically, it starts off and Enos is praying and God's like, I forgive you, Enos. And Enos is like, whoa, this prayer stuff really works. And he's like, I know God can't lie. And this is like verse six, keeps going. And He's, he's never had this kind of experience before, and so he's starting to desire the welfare of his brethren. So he's like, I'm going to pray for the Nephites. I'm going to pray for them and see how it goes. And the Spirit of the Lord comes to him again and says, I'll, I'll visit thy brethren according to their diligence in keeping my commandments. And so Enos is like, whoa, this is so cool. I've prayed for myself. I've received an answer. I've prayed for the Nephites, the good guys, and I've received an answer. Who else can I pray for? And so now... He's, he's saying basically like, I'll read a little bit more than I was thinking. This is, so in verse 13 of Enos, he says, And now behold, this was the desire which I desired of him, that if it should be that my people the Nephites should fall into transgression and by any means be destroyed, that the Lamanites should not be destroyed. So he's saying like, if the good guys, if the Lamanites, so to speak, or if the Nephites are destroyed, I don't want the Nephites to be destroyed. And I hope that, that God would preserve this record. He's talking about like the Book of Enos, the Book of Mormon, and of my people, the Nephites, even if so be by his power of his holy arm that it might be brought forth at some future day unto the Lamanites, that perhaps they might be brought to salvation. So he's saying like, these guys that want to kill my people, if they somehow succeed at killing my people, I hope that God protects this record so that later this record could teach the people that are trying to kill my people about God. And here are the, the few key verses. For at the present, our strugglings were in vain in restoring them to the truth faith. And they swore in their wrath that if it were possible, they would destroy our records and us, and also the traditions of our fathers. So he's saying, at present, we're not able to work with the Lamanites. We're not able to work with these guys that are trying to kill us, trying to and if they're trying to destroy our faith and tear it apart. And he says, wherefore... I, knowing that the Lord God was able to preserve our records, I cried unto him continually, for he said unto me, Whatsoever thing thee ask in faith, believing that ye shall receive in the name of Christ, ye shall receive it. And I had faith, and I did cry unto God that he preserved the records, and he covenanted with me that he would bring them forth unto the Lamanites in his own due time. So here I am. I have been praying, and I've been asking God, 
you know what, these kids that have gay parents aren't going to be able to receive the Holy Ghost in their teenage years when I feel it was most important in my life. And here's God giving me an answer. And this is when I felt that prompting go away when I read these words. Whatsoever thing you ask in faith, believing that you shall receive in the name of Christ, you shall receive it. And then he says, And I had faith, and I did cry unto God, that he would preserve the records, that he covenanted with me, that he would bring them forth unto the Lamanites in his own due time. So, I didn't have a specific answer that, yes, this policy is from God, but I did have a specific answer from God, using the scriptures to speak to me, that God's saying, you know what? Keep praying. Keep praying in faith. And I'm sure he means that to all of us, not just specifically me, Skylar, Skylar Baird, but rather everyone. Keep praying in faith, and in my own due time, I will give the gospel to these children. And so, for me, that was enough. I mean, if this policy isn't of God, it's not going to be on my head. That's going to be on the leaders who put the policy in place. That's going to be on their own head. And so for me, at this current time, that answer is good enough for me. Is that, you know what, keep praying, and I will change it in my own due time. I will fix this in my own due time. And so when that old due time is, I don't know. Um, but I do know I received that answer from God, and I can't deny it. So I wanted to share that with you today, that you can re remain a Mormon. You can remain a law-abiding citizen as far as the gospel is concerned and support the brethren. You can support your local leaders. And importantly, be a support for those that are are closer to leaving, closer to the door than, than any of us are. You know, there's going to be people out there that are really struggling with different aspects of the gospel. And just because there's judgmental people in your ward, just because there's ignorant people that you know in the stake or ignorant Mormons you know, doesn't mean that you are. Doesn't mean that you're ignorant. Doesn't mean that you're judgmental. Those people need you just like you need them. Um, they need you to, to share back love and compassion. They need you to, to show them the error in their way and to help them to become become better. Just the same as, as you're going to become better from overcoming the trial that they may be, the roadblock that they may be in your path right now. But leaving the church or deciding to have church at your own home isn't the answer. The answer is to be there for others, to, to buoy them up, to bear one another's burdens that they may be light. And you're going to be a help to those that are in need. So keep the faith. Keep receiving revelation. Go to the temple. Go to your meetings. Ask your bishop for a calling. And I'll leave these things with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.